Hi, this is Tom Van Maywen, Ear Hustle listener from Santa Barbara, California. The following episode of Ear Hustle contains language that may not be appropriate for all listeners. Discretion is advised. So, welcome to the program. I'll have more for you later, you know, in regards to it. Um, when the camera's not A little while back, E and I went to class. We did, and it was very classy. <laughs> I could tell by your face what you mean. It was a little dry. And I can guarantee you they're very high in regards to it. It was the first day of class for a group of formerly incarcerated men who are training to become California firefighters at a spot about an hour north of L.A. It's the Cal Fire Ventura Training Center. It's this cluster of buildings not far from the coast. We're in this one big classroom with 17 guys sitting at tables. They've each got a little name tag in front of them. Mm -hmm. Very first day of school feel. (laughs) And the guys had all just gotten out of prison. Some of them had been out for a few weeks and others for a few months. And the mood in the room was a mix of nerves, anticipation, and E, I have to say as a teacher, I definitely recognized a little bit of boredom. Ooh. (laughs) (laughs) But then these two guys got up to speak. And it's not going to be easy, guys. We're going to tell you right now, it's not easy. No. Okay? You are here given an opportunity, and it ain't going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. If you think that you're These were two formerly incarcerated men who are now professional firefighters. And as soon as they started talking, the energy in the room just changed. And these guys were looking sharp. Oh, yeah. They were dressed in these crisp navy blue uniforms, Cal Fire logos on their arm, shiny silver badges on their shirts. And one of them, a guy named Bay, starts telling the group a story about a time when he was in prison, in his cell in Folsom. And E, do you remember those um, scared straight groups? Yeah, you tell about the group of like high schoolers, they're taken into the prison and individuals inside show them what could happen to them if they didn't clean up their bad grades or their act. Exactly. And it was pretty aggressive. California prisons don't do that anymore. But back in the 90s, Bay was in his prison cell, and one of those scared straight type groups came through. And Bay realizes he was the thing that was supposed to scare these kids. I am an example of how not to be. Don't grow up to be like this. This is what society puts away. This is that ugliness of the world. Bay, like a lot of the guys here, had a long history of drug addiction. He spent years cycling in and out of the prison on drug charges. But that moment with the scared straight kids, that changed things for him. So while he was in prison, he got clean. And he got involved in fire camp. Those are minimum security facilities where incarcerated people fight fires. This is something we've talked about on the show. There's a long tradition in California of incarcerated people going out to fight fires. And this state really relies on them, Nye. Mm-hmm. They get paid a dollar an hour to risk their lives fighting fires. But once you get out of prison, if you keep it up, there's a possibility that you can make good money doing it. That's what Bay did. He got released, he worked towards his certification, and eventually he got a job with Cal Fire. Now he has that badge, that crisp navy blue uniform, and everywhere he goes, people treat him like a hero. We, we can't go anywhere, any restaurant where somebody will be, oh, thank you for your service. Thank you so much for your service, for what you do. I'm so grateful and humble, humble by the fact that I am was once an example of how not to be. And today, I'm here to tell you that that is not me today. And, and That was amazing. I mean, you could just tell from the expressions on those guys' faces, that was really landing with them. Yeah, it was like... You can be one of these guys. Like, this is a path that can be done. And it was really powerful. Erlon, we've talked to guys on the show before who had a really hard time getting out of prison and staying out. I mean, getting out of prison is overwhelming. It's really stressful particularly for guys who had a drug problem before they went in. This is where they get tripped up at. Oh, yeah. But one major thing that can help is if you have a job to come out to. And that's what Fire Camp is all about. This program is specifically for guys. 
And yes, just guys uh -huh. who were on fire teams while they were inside, but need to do the training to get certified as firefighters now that they're out. In this program, they get paid and their room and board is fully covered. And if they can stick with the program for the full 18 months, you graduate on the path to a career with a good salary, pension, all of that stuff. But Nige, 18 months? That's a long time for a guy. Like, you know, you just spent the last five years of your life in prison. You want to be out here in the world. You don't want to be busting your ass out in the sticks. You want to be bada bing, bada bang, busting your ass. <laughs> okay, exactly <laughs> right. Okay, I get it. So, this fire camp, it might be more than some of these guys are willing to put up with. I'm Erlon Woods. And I'm Nigel Poor. This is Ear Hustle from PRX's Radiotopia. Go. Crew three, moving. 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 So, the first class we met, those guys were just starting out. It was day one for hell week for them. But <laughs> not far away, we met another group of guys, another class actually, who had been there, I think, for about three months. Right. And these guys were practicing winding up hoses, you know, getting all the water out of them. There were these two firefighters, and each of them had something like 100 feet of hose. Oh! And they make this windmill motion to wrap those hoses around their shoulders. It was so cool to watch it. It's like this kind of synchronized ducking and weaving. I mean, honestly, it could be a dance. <laughs> this team is tight. I mean, they are firing on all cylinders. Yeah, those guys are on it for sure. Meanwhile, the class that started today, those guys were still kind of finding their bearings. What's up? Uh... We met Levi Rozier around on the other side of the building. He has long, blonde hair. Oh, Erlon, I noticed it in the classroom. It's actually longer than mine. And he has this real Southern California surfer vibe. <laughs> Honestly, I was surprised he had shoes on. Leave this on or take this off? Levi had only been out of prison for two months when we met him. He'd been in and out of the system since he was 12. I was in the foster care system, and then I got transferred to the delinquency system. Then it was just in and out of juvenile hall because I didn't have anywhere to live and I would run away from the group homes and then it's just been in and out of jails and prison since then. So that was my sixth term and all of them are about three years, two years, you know, four years. So if, if, if anybody in this program is hungry, it's you then? Yeah, yeah, I really want it. Uh, my name's Andrew Morales, and I'm here at the Ventura Training Center. Andrew Morales is also a part of the new class. We sat down with him at a picnic table in this grassy area next to the dormitories where these guys is going to be shacked up for the next 18 months. I swear those sprinklers were going all the time down there. All the time. What was the conversation last night like in the dorm with people? Um... It's still just hitting everybody. Everyone's just, man, like, this is crazy. This is crazy. And, and uh, people are just, they can't believe, like, this is where we're at right now. This is what came out of all the trouble that we put ourselves in. I can see that. Everything's new, you know. And this whole new chapter in your life is just happening so fast. And Andrew knew from being a firefighter inside that the work is grueling and exhausting, but he stuck with it because he knew it could lead to something better. The way I see it was that it, when I got out, I had this waiting for me. I was like, I'm just gonna keep, keep pushing it because it's gonna benefit not just me, but my family and, and that's what just kept me going. My little ones, uh, they're six and 10, they're telling everybody, my daddy's a firefighter, they're proud. I still talk to them every day. It's, it's good. Then these here are dumbbells. I'm going to go for the 30s based on. Right past the picnic table where we were talking to Andrew, there was a weight pile with a gang of different weights and exercise machines. These guys are going to be carrying 60-pound packs up mountains, so yeah, they have to be here. in really good shape. I'll be out here going, uh, uh. I got on the weights, and I hit a few sets, mm -hmm. and I was like, man, if I had these, I'd get that 
bedroom for Zeke back in no time. <laughs> and Nige, I seen you over there on them ropes too. Oh yeah, battle ropes? I love those. Over by those weights, we met Barrett Brown. And you could tell by looking at him that he spent a lot of time on those weights. Yeah, he had that swoleness. He'd been in the program for a while, so we wanted to pick his brain. And right then, the new class walked by. Yep, here's the new cohort right yeah, now. Yeah, I see him. Do you think they... Hey, good morning. How do you think they slept last night? Mm, on edge. <laughs> it's just new. I mean, anytime you go to a new environment, it's not comfortable. You're trying to figure things out. It's hard. Barrett applied for this program while he was still locked up. It's pretty competitive. Not everybody who applies gets admitted, and Barrett did. But still, he wasn't totally sold on it. So on one of my collect phone calls to my family, I, uh, I just mentioned it. And they, my sister basically said that I would be stupid if I didn't do it. Uh, I ran it by a friend of mine who, you know, who was uh, more into the street life out there. And she said I would be stupid if I didn't do it. So I had, uh, I had opinions from both worlds, and I put it in my head, and then I just started shooting for it, and that was my only goal in sight. After he got here, though, he wondered if he'd made a big mistake. A lot of the other guys in the class were asking themselves the same question. It was hell for us. We felt like we were no longer free again. Uh, we went through all kinds of changes uh, emotionally. Uh, some of us, including myself, con- contemplated leaving. I was on the edge for a while. He said arriving at fire camp brought back memories of the first time he was locked up in a tiny cell. But if you can imagine getting put in your in your restroom for, let's say, the first two and a half years fighting your case or something. If you can imagine what that mentally does to you, it damages us. So when we get out, our thinking isn't as clear as it should be. We don't want to feel like we're locked up. And then you get here, somebody's putting you back in that box. And that's how you feel. You feel like you're being put back in that box. So today was your first day here, right? Yeah. What is honestly going through your mind? A lot of things changed from what I thought I was signing up for. So I'm kind of a little irritated and questioning it because a lot of stuff changed. Levi, the guy who'd been in the system since he was 12, says he wanted to be a firefighter since he was young. He loves the idea of helping people and saving lives. But on his first day, he was already having misgivings. Mm -hmm. He told us he thought he was going to be able to go home to San Diego every weekend. But now it looks like that's not the case. Also, the program is 18 months, but he came in thinking he might get a job with Cal Fire in like six. Then there was Shortgate. I just brought shorts because I figured, okay, we're getting uniforms. Well, I guess they took my dress and my demeanor as not being serious about the program. And then uh, they were like, well, it's regulated that you are not allowed to wear shorts here. So so I'm from San Diego. I don't even have pants. So she was like, well, I need you to go buy pants today. And then today I went in there, they gave me a verbal warning for basically a dress code violation. But when he thinks about throwing in the towel, there's a big thing holding him back. If I do say, screw it, I'm gonna have to go back to my family and with my track record, all they're gonna see is, (laughs) oh dude, you freaking got our hopes up again. You lied to us. Like, you're back, what are you doing? But E, you are really rooting for Levi. <laughs> I am. He's like the underdog to me. Mm-hmm. It's like in the movies. He's the scruffy guy over there that's going to end up being the hero. Watch. All right. I say stick it out, man. I, de- I mean, shit, if this is what you want, I mean, it's on you. Yeah, I think it's a good opportunity. Definitely. And it's, it's work history, if nothing else. So you gonna you going to stay the night or are you going to take off? Are you done with it? No, I'm probably going to stick it out because it seems like it's still worth it. I don't know, E. I was a little bit like, come on, guys. I mean, this seems like a really good deal, you know? Like, the food is good, everything's paid for, and they're actually being paid to train for a totally solid career. 
Yeah, but I think if you haven't spent time in prison, it's hard to understand what it does to you, you mm -hmm, know? Mm -hmm. Like, it's really hard to be released and then feel like you're getting your freedom limited all over again. Yeah, I mean, that is exactly what I heard from Barrett Brown, that guy who'd been with the program for a while. But so how can someone like me be sympathetic? Because I, I did start to feel judgy, like, come on, you guys, this is an amazing opportunity. Yeah. So, so give me advice on how to, to not be judgy. Um, just try to be more, try to be understanding that of what we, we come from. It's, it's something that's ingrained in, in us in, the, in prison. And any time we get a little feel of that, we, we just feel like caged animals. And it, we don't have a word, we don't have a say, we don't have anything, we have no freedoms. So that's why we run so hard when we get out. Can you just give us a list of all the injuries you've had since you've been here? No, that poison oak was really bad. That was the worst thing. Blisters, cuts, bruises, uh, shoulder injuries, back, neck, uh, tendonitis in the elbows. You know, I mean... And you're only 28? Yeah. <laughs> Eric Kesselmark started at the fire camp a few months ago, and this course is pretty much his first shot at having some kind of stability in his life. I was homeless off and on since I was 13 years old. At that age, I thought it was an adventure. I didn't know what the struggle was. Were you on your own or were you with your family? And you I, was in, I was in a van with my mom. Okay. Like, living in a van, what is that like? Oh, are you in the same spot or are you in different spots? I would go to sleep at a truck stop, right? We get chased out. I'll go to sleep at a truck stop, I'll wake up at a park. And then I'll go take a bird bath in, <laughs> in the restroom while my mom's standing guard at the door. And then I'll go right to school. But I mean, it was normal, I guess, for you, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was a, it was an adventure. I didn't see nothing wrong with it, yeah. you know. But once I came to grasp that, oh man, this is what we've been doing this whole time, and this is what my mom been going through this whole time, you know, struggling, yeah. you know, trying to find the next meal. She would pawn off her rings, so we can get something to eat, and then somehow try to get them back. What is the worst thing you've seen in your life? Truthfully. Mom getting beat. Yeah. And seeing her getting carried out in an ambulance by because the guy tried to snap her neck. Yeah. And that's uh, the number one reason why we were homeless because she couldn't work anymore. Yeah. So that, that was, it was kind of crazy. How old were you? I was seven. Seven. Eric was put in foster care and spent some time living with an older brother. By the time he was 18, he was on meth. When he was 20, he got arrested and sentenced to 10 years. When he got out, he had nowhere to go, and he realized he was homeless again. I broke down. I broke down and cried. I did. I was like, no, not again. Here we go. And then I was out on the streets for two days, two nights. So during those two days, what did you think was going to happen to you? I didn't know. I was all I was doing. I was praying. I was praying. Lord, please not again. I've been seeing. I'm walking down the streets and I'm seeing these guys filthy. I'm seeing this guy defecated all over himself. I'm seeing. I'm like, I broke down. I I was, I was broken right there. I was like, no, I don't want to be like this. I do not want to be like this again. I mean, I, I kept clean. When I was homeless, I always took a bird bath, took a shower wherever I can. But when I saw those guys barefooted, seeing the guys on a cardboard and just sitting there wasting their lives away, I'm like, I was like, yeah. Eric was going to do everything he could not to end up like those guys. One of the first things he had to do was meet up with his parole officer. But her office was 10 miles from where he'd been dropped off after getting out. He had no money, so he had to walk there. And I had a 70-pound duffel bag full of my property. <laughs> I was hanging it out like this. I was like, oh my goodness, this sucks. And so I ended up giving this guy a watch. I was like, man, I'll give you this watch if I can have that stroller you got so I can push my stuff in, you know? Because this thing is getting heavy. My ankles were swollen. And he went for it? Oh yeah, he was like, all right, cool. But what sucked was I was going, you know, Wheel fell off after a while. Uh, some odd reason, I guess, from the friction, it got hot and melted off. I'm like, 
You gotta be kidding me. He did finally get to the parole office. He actually ended up sleeping outside of it. They said I have to be over there by a certain time, so I was like, man, I'm not gonna violate my parole. So you, you slept close to the parole office? Oh, right there on the front porch, right behind a bush. When he finally did meet with his parole officer, she got him set up with a room at the Salvation Army. He says if she hadn't been there to help him, things could have gone pretty differently. I don't know what that path would have been, to tell you the truth. That's, that's a pretty scary thought. Eric had been on the waiting list at the Ventura Training Center. A few days before Christmas, they called him to let him know a spot had opened up. He started a week later and says his dream is that when he finishes, he'll be able to rejoin his mom. Where is she at now? She's in Georgia. She's in, I don't know why she's in Georgia. But How's she doing? She, she's doing okay. I mean, I can see in her eyes that she's losing it. You know? And, yeah. I, I hope that's not the case. But I pray for her. What do you mean, losing it? Like, reality. Hmm. And so, but... So in about another 10 months, you'll be ready. Hopefully. I'd yeah, love you'll... to take care of her. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You'll be ready. Go on she deserves it. She deserves one of her sons to take care of her. And that's I, what's up. I think that's me. So that's the reason why I stay here. That's what gives me the drive. Yeah. yeah. I told her, I said, Mom, I need you. Stay with me. Because you, you're going to get that ranch. You're going to get your horses. Mm-hmm. You're going to get your horses. So. What's that about? She was a horse trainer. She for, was, a horse, tra- or she was yeah. a horse trainer? Yeah, she was a horse trainer for 15 years. Before we were homeless, we had a nice house. You know, it was it was a two-story building. It was in Santa Seno. And it was on Tiger Lane, right across the street from the high school that my brother went to nice neighborhood you know nice people and she would come home smelling like horse you know the the horse crap (laughs) what's crazy though is that when I smell it it brings back that memory when she comes back home we all run to mom you know and mom you know and uh, she used to take us to the ranch we'll go uh, ride the horses So once you do this, and if you end up going to take care of your mom, what will it be like? What will it be like? I'd give her a purpose. You know, I'd give her a purpose of the day. Because that's the main thing. I'd love to give her something to do. Take care of the horses. Take care of the garden. Just give her something to do instead of being in her mind. You know, take her out of her mind. Just give her, give her some tools to come back. When we get back, we put on our packs and head up the mountain. It's Wednesday morning, the third day of class, and it's sown. <laughs> when we get to the training center, the guys are already into their first big test, a physical exam. If anyone cannot finish each part of the exam, Erlon, they're out of the program. Mm. So far, they already passed the pull-ups, the push-ups, and the sit-up test, and now they have to run two miles under 18 minutes. Oof. Come on, Levi. Hey, all right, Levi. <laughs> yeah, he was doing it, man. Everyone was cheering each other on, and they all finished the run, no problem. As soon as they was done running, they all start filling up their water bottles. It was time for the hike. Right, the hike. And Erlon, I was a little bit nervous. It's three miles straight uphill, which may or may not sound like a lot, but it's kind of a desert out there, and there's no shade, and the day was already heating up. Plus, when we talked to him earlier, 
Barrett had made the hike sound kind of rough. Yeah, what are these hikes? We've been told about these hikes. What, describe them, please. Pretty much uh, hell on earth for me. Shit, why? Uh, because they're pretty intense. You know, yesterday we gained almost a thousand feet elevation in an hour. My mind was telling me so many crazy things, so many crazy things, uphill in sand within the heat. And I was like, I couldn't breathe, I couldn't walk, I was wobbling, I was just going and going and going, one step, one step, one step, one step. And it was, I, I can't, coming back down that mountain, I couldn't, I couldn't even fathom how I made it up. Okay, good morning. This is going to be your qualification hike. We took a 45-minute drive to the trailhead. All of the students gathered around the captain who was going to be timing them. This is a timed three-mile hike. It will finish in 60 minutes. This is one of the tougher parts. There'll be a truck behind you. If you are sick, you're not looking good, you'll be told to step out and you'll get in the truck and we won't debate it. All right. Let's, uh, so this is the starting point, that orange line right here. Captain Easley, are you ready for time? Okay, on the count of three. One, two, three, begin. Erlon, they are cruising. And I was back there just like taking selfies and wasn't even <laughs> tripping. And <laughs> next thing I know, they was like way up there. Oh, I know. And I'm going to say I'm in fairly good shape, but I could not keep up. We were immediately way in the back. Our producer, Bruce, was carrying the recorder, trying to keep up. Soon, the only guy we could see was my boy, Levi, the underdog in the back of the pack. Yep, and one of the captains gave him a gentle prod. And we're about a half mile in for 10 minutes. Copy? Yep. Yes, sir, right? Oh, man, I was worried about Levi. But remember what happened mm-hmm. as we were getting close to the halfway mark? Oh, yeah. Levi dug in. He found something within himself, and he just started passing people. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> That's Levi just running by the other four. Guys, you're at 23 minutes, 24 seconds. This is the halfway mark. You don't have to go any faster. If I were you, I wouldn't go any slower, but you don't have to go any faster. Remember, Speaking of the halfway mark, that's where we met back up with the guy who was timing the hike. And how about that, Nige? He was in a Jeep. Thank God. Would you like to go up with me? Of course. Just climb on in there. And Nige, mm-hmm. we were right there at the finish line when the first guy crossed. Who's in front? Morales. Morales. Andrew Morales the guy we met back on the first day, and he won the race. He was the first one up there. (laughs) And right behind him was Joseph. (laughs) Oh, shit, man. You kept me going. Still got it. All right. You in the front of the line. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So you did it, right? That's it. That's it for now. (laughs) What are you? 23. He's got 10 years on me, though. So So I can't let him pass me. Yeah. (laughs) A few more guys crossed the line, and then, with time to spare... Let's go, Levi. Let's go, Levi. Levi jumped in front. Levi. My boy. Name. Mm-hmm. Let's go. Rozier. Rozier. 52, 52. Yeah. 54, 14. Everybody pass. Good stuff, guy. Good stuff. Bad ass, gentlemen. Uh, Captain. So I have an announcement to make. So this is class seven. You guys are battalion seven, okay? You guys are the first class out of all seven where there is not a single retake on the physical fitness portion, okay? Let's go. Wrap it up. Wrap it up. I expect you guys to be breaking records this whole time, okay? Great job, you guys. Before we left the top of the hill, the group gathered to take a picture together. But I noticed that Levi was kind of standing off to the side a bit, kind of apart from the group. Right, right. So later I asked him how he was getting along with the other guys. Are you reaching out to anybody and trying to make connections? With with time, we're all going to get to know each other, you know? Mm -hmm. So... Sometimes it's it's better to take that type of thing slow and really kind of see or fill out who people are. What do you think you're going to be feeling in a couple weeks? Where do you think you're going to be emotionally and physically? Um, I don't know. The classroom part, I'm kind of a little nervous about that. 
so I'm not sure. Hello? Yeah. Can I get me? three chicken flautas? A large Jamaica? Hello? Are you there? Hey, this is okay. Erlon, Nigel, and Bruce. A couple of weeks after we came home from fire camp, we gave Levi a call. Who are you trying to call? Levi. Call Levi. Yeah, this is Levi. All right. Do you remember us, Nigel and Erlon, that interviewed you when you was in... Oh, yeah. How are you guys doing? Oh, okay. Man, I'm, all right. How are you? I'm doing good. It, we wanted to catch up with you. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm just eating right now. <laughs> oh, it's it, no big deal. So while you wait on your food, do you mind if we have a couple of questions and record it? Go ahead. Can you give us an update on what's going on in your life? Um, well, the clutch on my car went, is going out, so I'm buying a new clutch. I'm working my old job doing rebar. I got a raise, $20 an hour. Yeah, turns out Levi left fire camp the day after we did. He told us the final straw was when the captain told him he needed to take some more classes so he could get his high school diploma. Which pissed Levi off because he had his GED already. I told him there's no way I'm going to be able to do the fire curriculum, all the physical stuff, and the high school classes. But let me ask you this. After that conversation, you just packed up your stuff and left? Yeah. How'd that feel? Well, what sucks is that I had to come back and ask, you know, of course, my family... Is probably thinking I just gave up. Well, how did you how did you describe it to your family, and how did they take it? Because I remember when we talked to you, you said you were worried they would say, "Oh, another thing I didn't complete." Well, yeah, I don't know what they really feel. I would imagine me. I would think, yeah, this guy, you know, they had their hopes up really high, but they just kind of knew how how much I wanted to do the firefighting thing. So they like, mm-hmm. man, that sucks. But keep your head up and keep keep pushing for it. Hey, you know, you know, in that program, man, you you was an underdog for me. I knew you was going to, you know, be the man in that program. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah, but man, I just found out today you were no longer in the, in the, in the program. That's crazy. Yeah, but you can't be a sucker or you'll always be in a sucker's position, you know? You know, I wish Levi well. Yeah, I do too. We also caught up with Andrew Morales, the guy who finished the hike first. And he was, not surprisingly, still all in. So wait, how is the new crew bonding? Uh, well, today it was really cool. We laid out 1,100 feet of hose together as a crew and went up against uh, crew crew one that's been here for 12 months and we beat them wow. so, and, yeah, yeah yeah so that was cool that was exciting we've been doing all kinds of things together man and everybody's finding their spot and everybody's clicking and everything's changing for the good it's crazy it's <laughs> i never i never thought i i'd have this would be my life i it's insane man it's crazy <laughs> That's great. Right. All right. I, I mean, All right. you're. I know you can't see us, but when you're talking, you're smiling so much. So that tells me that things are really good. Yeah, like you're feeling I, good I was, about yourself. <laughs> I am. Everything, like I said, everything's going smooth, and and everybody's happy here, and everybody that here wants to be here. You know that brotherhood, that bond. We're like road dogs. Would you be shocked at this point if somebody else dropped out? There ain't nobody gonna leave. Okay. Nobody's, nobody's going to leave. There's, I'm not, that's not even a thought. All the little rituals of being a firefighter were becoming routine, like polishing your boots every night. So we're right here sitting next to each other. and We're trying to get it the best we can and see who can get the shiniest boots. So after you get back from whatever you're doing, straight to the boots. Shine, shine, shine. <laughs> I never had to do that in my life. and It's, it's a pain in the ass, but I'm, we're all getting the hang of it. But at the same time, 
I think the reality is setting in that this is a really hard life they've chosen. And a dangerous one, too. Yeah. Uh, I actually woke up. It was, I think it was Monday. And um, I stood up and I'm looking around and I just asked myself, like, what the fuck am I doing here? A few days before, Andrew had gotten some news about another formerly incarcerated firefighter who had been through the same program. He got hired with the Orange County Fire Department, and he was on that Blue Ridge fire in Orange County. And um, he got 50% of his body burned, and he's, he's not, doing, not doing good at all. Oh, so that wow. kind of, yeah, he's, he's, so I think it was like a doctor's induced him into a coma because of all the pain. I guess that helps him. But he had all of his crew. There was like 45 men that went to go visit him. His mom and dad were there. And so the chief went over there and got him to understand, like, look, we're all here because we're, we're a family. We're here to support you, and we're here to support each other. And when one goes down, we all go down. Wow. But that's intense. No wonder you were, like, woke up feeling weird. Yeah. I, I really did. For like two days, I, I was I was just like a zombie, I guess. I was just, okay, I'm here. I'm just going to go line up. And we still don't really know what happened. I imagine when that happens, doesn't everyone think, shit, that could happen to me. Like, that could be me. Of course. I called I called my girl, my girlfriend, I, because I needed to talk to somebody about it. I called my daughters and, you know, I just wanted to talk to them. I wanted to see them. And it's just like, wow, like, I, was, I told my girlfriend, I don't want you to think, like, this can't happen to me because any day. And I needed her to, to know, like, that's how quick things change. Did she ever say, mijo, come home? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> all the time but it's been hard there's been a lot of tears what are the tears about me being gone and then missing me they want to make plans but i don't know up until the last minute we don't know when we're gonna get the day off or we're gonna get a couple hours off or the whole weekend off right and that's not gonna change right that's it's always gonna be like that for the rest of this career Fighting fire has always been a hard job. It's dangerous and you're away from home, but it's actually becoming even harder. Yeah, I mean, with global warming, California's fire season is getting rougher every year. Mm -hmm. The fires are getting bigger and it's causing way more destruction. Oh, yeah. And you know those guys we heard talk um, to the class at the top of the show? Who, Ariel and Bay? Exactly. They have been out going from fire to fire, away from home, for like four months now. That's crazy. Oh, it is crazy. Okay, but we do have some good news. The guy Andrew told us about who was burned really badly, well, a few weeks ago, he came out of his coma, and he still has a long recovery ahead of him, but he is truly getting better every day. Definitely wishing him a speedy recovery. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks to Michelle Garcia, Jeremy Brandt, and Michael Sellis at the Ventura Training Center. Ear Hustle is produced by Nigel Poor, Erlon Woods, Rasan New York Thomas, John Yaya Johnson, and Bruce Wallace. This episode was engineered by Antoine Williams with music by Antoine and David Jossi. Amy Stanton edits the show, and Julie Shapiro is the executive producer for Radiotopia. Ear Hustle would like to thank acting warden Ron Broomfield, and as you know, every episode of Ear Hustle has to be approved by this guy here. All right, so uh, how you? What, what's your thoughts on this episode, man? Man, you know, um, I was thinking about all you brothers who have been on that ride. You know what I mean? Who've uh, been incarcerated and did extraordinary things inside, and, and got the opportunity for another chance at life, man. And I was just kind of just going through the mental rolodex of of where you guys are and how you guys are back in the community and are doing good things, man. And uh, it definitely gave me something to, on that tip to um, be thankful about. And with that, you know, I say I, I approve this episode. 
This podcast was made possible with the support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Working to redesign the justice system by building power and opportunity for communities impacted by incarceration. Ear Hustle is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX. Radiotopia is a collection of independent, listener-supported podcasts. Yep, some of the best podcasts around. That includes us. (laughs) Hear more at Radiotopia.fm. We wanted to extend a warm welcome to Shabnam Sigman. What up, Shabnam? She just joined the team as our new digital producer. And Erlon, as you know, she is awesome. For sure. Before we go, we want to give thanks. That's right. A special thank you to some of the people who donated to Ear Hustle's last fundraising campaign. Originally, we were going to say their names in the credits. But then we decided to do something a little more special. Yep. We thought... Let's let our sound designer, Antoine, do his thing and bring you some fire. Yeah. All right. So we're going to do it like this. Look, <clears throat> this is a thank you from the entire Air Hustle team. Where will we be? I sit back and think. Who knew appreciation could run this deep? If we never speak, I get a chance to meet. You should still know how much it means. So thank you for everything. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for everything. For real. Thank you. Thank you for listening to focus on humanity. It's how we change conditions. We all play a part in this world that we living in. We can change the outcome if everyone is pitching in. So let's get started. We got David Arden. We got Kerry Hoffman. We got Lori Kaufman. Yes, I'm not flossing. I promise not trying to brag. We can only go up with Ellen De La Paz. All facts. These people do more than listen. Mary Minor, Rachel James, and of course, Janelle Dixon. And I'm not kidding. No magic. There's no illusion. You people with real power like Liz Hughes. See what I'm doing, I know it's kind of clever I'll confess it when I'm talking with Nadia Boats Whoever, it gets better and better Barbara Denevers And we would do more if the world would let us <laughs> And once you listen to the story You'll start feeling like your family Tell them Robin Corey You didn't do it for me, you did it for the whole You did it Jan Clark, you did it Nina Go. Now we golden, Victoria hone in Open up your heart and let these names start to soak in It's so important these voices matter. Thank you, Laura Belza, Julia, Matter. We gon' do it major. We gon' do it major. I say a name, justice for Brianna Taylor. We cannot waver. We gotta be strong. Come on, Philippe, Aldi, Catherine, Long. It's gon' take backbone, but it's needed in the leader. Come on, Griffin Riley. Come on, Katie Peters. If life is but the teacher, then we all students. And today's lesson is that we all humans. Uh. This is how I commend you. It takes the whole to fix the whole. And surely you contribute. This is just a gift. I get to present you with honor. A thank you that's monumental. Thank you. Where will we be? Come on, man. Where will we be? Sit back and think. Who knew appreciation could run this deep? If we never speak, I get a chance to meet. This is a thank you from the Air Hustle team. So thank you for everything. Thank you for everything. Truly. All right, but let's do it like this. <laughs> Look. All right, all right, before I drop the mic, we got to thank Amanda Aaron off and Alfred White. Kathy Margulies, dig me like gardening. Pam Tindall, Sarah Tisdale, part of me like hearts need arteries. You are now a part of me. You have been the blessing. Thank you for your offerings. And I'm just a man of candor, so thank you, Lindsay Cantor, JJ Panzer. Everybody stand up, Steffi McKenna. If we work together, then y'all secret Santa. Together we can answer any question that evolved. Well, Maryland, worse, and we in Butcher Hall. Get involved, get involved, we prevailing. Tell them Deanna Cannon said, tell them John Helen. Thanks, Freely Sealing, we owe more than a favor. To y'all, Bill Resnick and Laura Shoemaker, Christian Gamut. And Steve Kaplan, Susan, I see you, McDonough, what's happening? Love them trying to package it and ship it out to all of y'all. Sophie Vanderput and all of those is called upon. Love can never break up. Kirsten, Lake Brook, and all the donors slept on. The world's about to wake up. And this is all the 
that I can offer. A sincere thank you, Michelle, Lawford, Allen, Palmer Ranch, Jeremy, Mar. Your support got the team feeling stronger than armor. We wish the best karma on Camilo Ruiz. And I can't forget Lucier, merci. Where would we be? Who knew appreciation could run this deep? If we never meet or get a chance to speak, you should still know how much it means. So thank you for everything. For me and everybody a part of the Air Hustle team. Sincerely, truly, thank you for everything. Radiotopia from Peace.